bon, uh, let, let us start the second uh, lecture, Professor Vandenberg, please. So can you hear me? In, good. So the topic of today's lecture is the theory of cosmological perturbations, which is the main tool that we use in cosmology to connect theories of the very old universe to current data. So this is a very important tool. And uh, for those of you who are interested in studying it, there's a review article. Um, and if you are interested in more details than is in this review article, there's a 200-page review article uh, written in 1992 by Slava Mukhanov, Feldman, and myself. But uh, this is a good starting point. OK, so I started by drawing the space-time diagram of one of the scenarios of early universe cosmology, namely inflation. So time, physical spatial distance, and uh, here I draw the Hubble radius. So this is a period of inflation, exponential expansion. This is the end of inflation. And uh, here, this is the Hubble radius. And here I draw the wavelength of a fluctuation. So again, the data most of the data concerns inhomogeneities and anisotropies, which is fluctuations. The wavelength of fluctuations is constant in co-moving fluctuations coordinates. So in physical coordinates, it's exponentially increasing. And so we are interested in a theory that's operating in the very early universe, and we want to compare with observations. So we have several ingredients that we need to study. For If we imagine that it is quantum mechanics which is responsible for the generation of fluctuations, then we have the quantum generation. And then, for a long time, the fluctuations evolve with a wavelength greater than the Hubble radius, where general relativity is the dominant actor. So we have the period of relativistic evolution. And then we have a period here at late times where the wavelength is smaller than the Hubble radius, where we can use Newtonian evolution, where the relativistic evolution reduces to Newtonian evolution. Okay. So now the way that I will structure this lecture is I will first discuss the Newtonian evolution to develop physical intuition, then I will discuss the relativistic evolution, and then at the end, the quantum generation. Because the quantum generation might not even be necessary in different models. So this is a structure. And now, the quantity that we need to compute is the power spectrum. Of coverture fluctuations of um, the gravitational potential. So in the Newtonian theory, there's a Newtonian gravitational force. There's a Newtonian gravitational potential phi. And phi is a function of x and t. So you can expand that in spherical harmonics. Uh, this is a random variable with uh, okay. so epsilon k is normalized such that okay. co-moving 
X is co-moving, K is co-moving. These are co-moving coordinates, like I introduced yesterday. And then the power spectrum of phi is defined in units, I don't care about the factors of pi, it is k cubed, phi tilde of k t squared. Okay. This is the power spectrum, and this is what we need to compute, because this is what we want to compute, compare with observations. Well, you see, we are computing the power spectrum, so the normalization is here. Therefore, this is unit amplitude. So, so no, I, I, I think this is, I think there's no issue. This is the way. Okay. Now, astronomers or cosmologists, they introduce a notation. So this is either classical or quantum random variable. So if you're interested in, in quantum generation, then there's a quantum process. But if it's a classical random process, then it's, it's just a stochastic process. Which measure are you using? I won't answer that question. Whatever, 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 uh, so I'm, Using, so you, you, let's say you give me a mechanism in the early universe which produces fluctuations. So you are giving me the measure, and then this is the measure that enters here. It's not the no, I'm just taking whatever your theory of initial conditions is that has the measure inbuilt, and then this is the way it works. Okay. Now this NS is called the scalar spectral index. And NS equals 1 is called scale invariant. Because remember yesterday when I mentioned the criteria for a successful early universe cosmology, I mentioned the fourth criterion was scale invariance. But I didn't, I didn't specify what that was. No one asked me that question. Now, here I'm giving you the giving you answer. So, so observations indicate that we need a scale invariant spectrum. And we need a scale invariant spectrum for the curvature perturbations, which means for, for gravity. OK, so this is notation. So now I will turn to um, A, which is the Newtonian theory. So, in the Newtonian theory, we have um, variables. So we have perfect fluid matter. So we have an energy density. We have a pressure. We maybe have a velocity of the fluid. And then we have uh, maybe even entropy. And then we have the Newtonian gravitational potential. So this specifies matter, this specifies gravity. So these are the variables. And then we have the equations. And the equations, there's a continuity equation, energy conservation equation, which reads this way. So this is energy conservation. And then there's the second equation is F equals MA, which is called the Euler equation. So V dot plus V gradient. So the full derivative. So this is the acceleration. And the acceleration is the sum of the forces. And there's one force which is due to the pressure gradient, and the other force is due to gravity, and this is equal to zero. So this is the Euler equation, F equals ma. 
And then the third equation is the fact that density perturbations induce the gravitational potential. And then we also have uh, an entropy conservation equation, which I'm not going to write down because there's no space here. And then in terms of the variables, the pressure is a typically a function of the energy density. So these are the equations of motion. So again, first step is variables. Second step is equations of motion. Third step is perturbation ansatz. So we assume that the, all of these variables are, have a background contribution, which is only time dependent, and small amplitude spatial perturbations. So we take rho of x and t to be background plus small amplitude perturbations, and the same for the pressure, background pressure plus pressure perturbations. And then we stick this perturbation ansatz into the equations of motion and linearize. So we get, um, with these equations, we get two first order uh, equations for the perturbations. And we will combine these two first order equations to get a second order equation. And the second e order equation that we get is delta rho double dot plus minus CS square, gradient square, delta rho, minus 4 pi G rho naught, delta rho, equals sigma, delta square, delta S. Where I have now assumed that the pressure fluctuation is related to the energy density fluctuation in this way and to the entropy this way. So here I've introduced the CS square and the sigma. So, and I should emphasize that these are spatial fluctuations and not temporal fluctuations. So this is not p dot, this is not rho dot. And if you assume that this is p dot and this is rho dot, and you get CS square using that wrong assumption, then you will get completely wrong cosmology. And I'll give you an example. You'll get completely wrong conclusions. CS square is defined this way, using the spatial fluctuations of p, the spatial fluctuations of rho. Uh, sorry, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to uh, agree with you. Uh, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to say that C S square is in general not equal to W, which is P over rho. No, I'm happy. You, you just this is the way that I define it. You can define it in a different way. Sure. But 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 just this is the way that I want to write it down. You so if I'm happy if you write it in an equivalent way. Good. <laughs> Good. 
Yep. Right. 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 There's a second equation, which is the entropy conservation equation, which is this. Delta S. OK. Good. So let me put this equation in the box. But don't write it down yet, because I'm going to make one change. So we are interested in linear perturbations. So theory of linear cosmological perturbations. Now, at linear order, each Fourier mode evolves independently. So therefore, we are going to go to Fourier space. Good. So now I want to interpret this equation. So, so this equation says that the way that fluctuations evolve is as a consequence of two forces. There's a pressure force that makes fluctuations oscillate. And this is a gravitational force, Newton's gravitational constant. And what this does is it makes fluctuations grow. There's a gravitational instability which makes fluctuations grow. And there's a pressure force which makes fluctuations oscillate. And here you see k squared here. So there's a critical uh, scale. Which is the genes scale. And this gene scale, k sub j, is given by equating these two coefficients. Cs square, kj square, equals 4 pi g rho naught. So now if you have small wavelengths, k greater than k sub g, this is subdominant. And to first approximation, you see that fluctuations oscillate. Whereas if you take long wavelengths, then the term that gives you oscillations is unimportant. Oscillations freeze out. And what happens is that fluctuations grow exponentially fluctuations grow. Okay. So now, what else? So this is the first lesson, number one. This is critical genes length. Um, lesson number two is that entropy fluctuations lead to uh, density perturbations. So if you have an entropy fluctuation, an asymmetry between different matter components, that generates a density perturbation. So number three is that entropy fluctuations don't grow. And the fourth lesson is that this critical scale depends on Cs square. For example, if you have radiation dominant, then Cs square is one third, and therefore Kj is very large. Uh, sorry, well, Kj is actually fairly small. Whereas if you have dark matter which dominates, particle dark matter, Cs square is 0, and therefore Kj is infinity, which means that you have instability for all wavelengths. Okay, so again, I've 
show now the Newtonian cosmological perturbation theory uh, off of a Minkowski background. And these are the four lessons. Number one, number two, number three, number four. And this is all based on this equation. So now, so far, I had Newtonian perturbation theory off of Minkowski spacetime, which is not actually not consistent. So now what I'll do is I'll do Newtonian perturbation theory about Friedman. Okay. So now, um, the thing is um, essentially identical, the procedure. I have the variables. And now since the background density is time dependent, I'm interested in the variable delta, which I define as rho divided by rho zero. Rho zero is background density. So this is the fractional density perturbation. So all the other variables are the same. So I have the same equation of motion, except that I have a different background. And the only change that happens here is that this equation changes slightly, and it changes in that there is a friction term, Hubble friction term. This wasn't present before. And here I have a k square over a square. So again, it's the cosmological scale factor, which I introduced yesterday. And here as well, k square over a square. And I put back this. So this is Newtonian perturbation theory off of an expanding background. Let me just check that. I didn't make a mistake. Sorry, I did make one mistake. This coefficient is 2 and not 3. OK. And OK, since this is delta and not the energy density, I have to divide this by rho 0. Okay. So this is Newtonian perturbation theory off of an expanding background. Fine. But you see that the lessons are going to be the same. Except that the co-moving gene's length will depend on time, because you have this factor k a squared. OK? So fluctuations oscillate. Well. You have damped oscillations because of this term. And fluctuations grow. Instead of exponential growth, you now get power law growth. I didn't write down before that it was exponential growth. But in expanding universe, it's power law growth. So th this is the Newtonian theory of cosmological perturbation. This should be there, yes. Otherwise, ah, uh, you are right. Should be gone. It was there before, and the problem is that it's there in my notes, and there's a mistake in my notes. Uh, thanks. This is Newtonian. This is Newtonian. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to give applications of this. So applications. So the first application is a comparison of universes with 
and without particle dark matter. So what I'll do is I'll compare the evolution of cosmological fluctuations in a universe in which the matter is, in one case, baryons and radiation. In the second case, baryons, subdominant to dark matter and radiation. So, And the lesson of this exercise is going to be that there has to be particle dark matter. In fact, this I view this as a prediction that was made in the 1960s of particle dark matter. OK, so what I will plot is the evolution in time of the energy density, delta rho, on scales corresponding to galaxies. So I don't write this down. So I'm interested in delta rho sub k for a k corresponding to the length scale of the galaxy separation. And there'll be three important times. T0, the present time, the time when the microwave background is produced, and the time of equal matter and radiation. Now, you see, this equation is only true if matter dominates. If radiation dominates, then I'm here following a subdominant component. So, first of all, I will look at a universe with uh, no particle dark matter. And this will be the white color. So we know the amplitude of the density perturbations today on galactic scales through observations. And these perturbations grow between recombination and the present time because matter is not coupled to radiation. So this is the evolution. So now let's take a universe which has dark which has dark matter and baryons. Well, there's no difference between recombination and the present time. So this is a universe with particle dark matter. This is a universe without particle dark matter. I take the same amplitude today. And so I'm working backwards in time. Now, between recombination and equal matter and radiation, a universe with baryons and without, with dark matter and without dark matter behave differently. Without dark matter, in this time interval, the baryons are coupled to photons. For photons, CS square is one third. The gene's length is large. And so therefore you get damped evolution of fluctuations. So the delta rho in a model without dark matter is damped. Whereas in a model in which dark matter dominates over baryonic matter, k square, j square, cs square is 0. And so therefore, kj square is infinity. So fluctuations evolve. They keep growing. So if you look at equal matter and radiation, there's a difference between the amplitude of the density perturbations if we have the same galaxy distribution today. Now, it is this amplitude which sets the amplitude of microwave anisotropies. So the amplitude of microwave anisotropies is set by the value of delta rho today uh, at equal matter and radiation. And so there's a difference. And this difference is about a factor of 30. And it turns out that this gives a factor of 32 large microwave anisotropies. This red curve is correct. So this is a simple exercise of this Newtonian theory. Um, this is my normalization. I'm normalizing the amplitude on galactic scales by today. Galactic scales today. If there's no particle dark matter, then in this time, then before recombination, the baryons are coupled to radiation. The, and if radiation has, an, has CS squared equals one third, so therefore you get a large, uh, a small KJ. 
fluctuations on galactic scales, therefore, are in the oscillatory regime, on the damped oscillatory regime. OK. So now, anyone who invents an alternative to particle dark matter has to face this issue. They have to show that, in their model, they get the correct agreement between the power spectrum of microwave anisotropies and the power spectrum of large-scale structure. Yeah. OK, so let me, I'm not going to answer that completely. I'm just going to restate that. This sets the amplitude of C and B. OK, so this comes from the Poisson equation that relates curvature perturbations, which give you the microwave and isotropies to the density perturbations. And on galactic scales, exit the Hubble radius at or before equal matter and radiation. And so therefore, that's. But this, you see, this, I'm not good. You shouldn't be perfectly happy with my answer. You should only see the glimpse of where it enters. So the microwave anisotropies are set by the curvature perturbations. The curvature perturbations are related to the density perturbations by the Poisson equation. And what matters is the amplitude of the, of the um, perturbations when they enter the Hubble radius, which is at or before equal matter and radiation. And that's where the scale enters. I'm looking at galactic scales. So this is where, where it enters. So I was sneaking this a little bit. I was pushing this a little bit under the rug. You forced me to lift it up. I partially lifted it up. So are you, more, are you a little bit happy? A little bit. I don't, you shouldn't be completely happy, because I didn't write down equation. OK. So this is the first application. Application number two is you have a unified fluid model of dark matter, dark energy. So in this case, what will happen is that W of t will approach minus 1 for late times. Now, for a fluid, you have Cs squared equals W. So W will, so Cs squared will approach minus 1. OK, so Cs squared approaches minus 1. You introduce an ultraviolet instability, an exponential ultraviolet instability. So this means instability for fluctuations. Now, it's OK if this instability acts for a very short period of time. But if you want to be consistent with observations, this, the redshift where this where the transition between dark matter and dark energy takes place has to be extremely close to redshift 0. It has to be so close to redshift of 0 that you cannot explain the supernova data. So now, this is uh, a reference with Rodrigo Cucinato at the And the archive number is 1802.01232. So this is the reference for, for this application. Yep. Yep. One component. So, yeah, you 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 can get around that problem. 
but I'll talk. I'll tell you how one does that privately. Okay, I, I just want to mention this as an application. So, you see, uh, C, for a perfect fluid, C S square is W. Good. So now, let me mention the third application. Let's assume that dark matter is a homogeneous scalar field. An oscillating scalar field. So if dark matter is a homogeneously oscillating scalar field, then you have W equals 0. At least the time average of W is equal to 0. So you might say, fine, CS square equals W is equal to 0, like dark matter. But you have CS square equals 1. So CS square equals 1 is that you don't have any growth of fluctuations on sub-Hubble scales. So here you have the opposite problem. You have no late time growth. Of fluctuations. So now some particle physicists might say, well, what about the axion? The axion is an oscillating scalar field. Well, if there were no axion domain walls, which then collide and form axionic particles, then axions would not work as dark matter. So the only reason why axions can work as dark matter is that you have most of the energy in the axions is not in the homogeneous component, but it's in the re remnant energy of axion oscillations. OK, so these are three. Yes, GR. No, GR is an ingredient. Based on GR, I have this equation. This is based on GR. The input is GR, linear theory of cosmological perturbations. Yeah, so fluid. Not going at all Perfect. Fluid. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just saying that you have to be careful. You have to be careful. Yeah. And you you see, th this is the power of this equation. No, it's very good, but I mean, there are hypotheses. Yeah. Sure. This uh, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm just giving you examples of how you can apply this equation. So if you have a perfect fluid, description of dark matter, dark energy. So if, sorry, I, I actually should have written perfect fluid. So there are generalized Chaplitian gas models which, which avoid this problem. But the simplest Chaplitian gas models have this problem. So the power of this equation here. Do you do, do I need? I, I don't. You see, I don't want to answer that question because uh, uh, because I want to move on to the relativistic theory. Can I move on to? Okay, good. So you see, if you go back to the initial graph that I had, all I'm discussing now is late time evolution of fluctuations. But fluctuations that we are interested in now, they were on super Hubble scales for a long time. And this entire Newtonian analysis breaks down. So I need to discuss the relativistic theory of cosmological perturbations. And I'll leave this equation untouched. Everything else can go. B 
be classical relativistic. Okay, so first of all, the variables. So now the variables are the metric, g mu nu. We don't just have a Newtonian gravitational potential, but we have the metric that describes the gravity. And then we have matter. Now, I would describe matter in terms of the simplest possible form of matter, namely a scalar field. So I can also do perfect fluid matter, but perfect fluid matter is more complicated in the matter sector than a simple scalar field. So now you see that you have many more variables than you had in the Newtonian theory. OK, so that's the variables. Then you have the equations of motion. Now the equations of motion are the Einstein equations. Highly nonlinear equations. And then you have the matter equation. The Klein Gordon operator acting on phi equals zero. Okay, so those are the equation motion. So the next step is perturbation ansatz. We write the metric as background metric, which only depends on time, this is background, plus small amplitude perturbations. So small amplitude fluctuations. We write the matter as background matter plus matter perturbations. By the way, there's one problem with my lectures. The problem with my lectures is that it is only the faculty members who are asking questions and not the students. So please, those of you who are students, also ask me questions. Or if you are too shy to ask questions, and come up to me afterwards to ask questions. OK. Good. So perturbation ansatz. So variables, equations of motion, perturbation ansatz. Next step. You plug this perturbation ansatz into the equations of motion and linearize. OK, so very simple. You see you have delta g mu nu. So the linearization of the Einstein tensor equals 8 pi g delta t mu nu. This is the linear, linear part of t mu nu. So these are the fluctuations equations in classical uh, relativity. Nice equations. Absolutely useless. So that's where no box. The reason why they are useless is that there are too many equations, because there's also a matter equation, which I didn't write down. 11 equations. And in addition, a lot of the information in these equations is complete gauge artifacts. Because imagine you take a nice universe without any fluctuations, a nice symmetric space-time, x, t. I draw it here as a rectangle to give you the impression that, they, that it is symmetric, no fluctuations. Now let's assume that I describe that I introduce some strange coordinates. X tilde, T tilde. The X tilde axis, the T tilde axis. The energy density depends on time in an expanded universe. So if I introduce if I introduce these strange coordinates, then in terms of these strange coordinates, X tilde, T tilde, I have space dependence. So in terms of these strange coordinates, I have fluctuations 
even though there are no fluctuations at all. So if you just do this, then you're carrying with you the junk of corner transformations. And you're, they are, at the linearized level, there are four corner degrees of freedom. So out of those 11 degrees of freedom, four are corner degrees of freedom. And if you use these equations, you're carrying with you the four degrees of freedom, four degrees of freedom which are unphysical. Now, OK. If you could solve these equations exactly, there'd be no problem. However, you never can solve these equations exactly. You have to do approximations. And if you do approximations, you are mixing corner degrees of freedom with physical degrees of freedom. You'll get use, you'll get, you'll be making mistakes. Okay, so therefore what we have to do is we have to be clever. We have to do, first of all, we have to do a classical uh, classification of fluctuations. Step A and step B, we have to eliminate Coordinate artifacts. Okay. So I'm going to classify. So, for example, if we're interested in density perturbations, we are not interested in gravitational waves. Gravitational waves propagate. We can also analyze them, but they are in completely independent to the density perturbations. So let's not mix gravitational waves and density perturbations. Let's treat them separately. That's the classification. So in this classification, we are reducing the number of degrees of freedom that we track. Here, we reduce the number of degrees of freedom that we track. And the result of this reduction is from 11 degrees of freedom, you go down to 1 degree of freedom. That's the simplification. And after this simplification, we get one equation which looks very similar to this one. OK, so bear with me. There'll be classification step and uh, elimination of coordinate artifacts. So now the classification is based on transformation under spatial rotations. So the background is as a special frame. And there are scalars, vectors, and tensors. So the scalars have the following form. You have a G00. These are equations which Nelson flashed up at the very end of his talk yesterday. Okay. So phi, b, e, and psi are functions of space and time. So these are four scalar modes. So if you do a spatial rotation, obviously this is unchanged. So this is a time component. These are the spatial components. The diagonal of the spatial is invariant. And you can construct, if you take the gradient of a function, then you have something which is invariant. Here, it's by symmetry. And if you take a second derivative, again. So you have four scalars. And then you have vectors. So I've already used G00. Um, Fi 
So I'm comma. So commas are regular partial derivatives. Okay, so I have four degrees of freedom. So I have four scalars. I have four vectors. And I have 10 total degrees of freedom. And the two remaining ones are the gravitational waves. Pencils. 0, 0, 0, H, I, J. Where H is transverse and traceless, the usual gravitational wave tensor. Two degrees of freedom. So this is the classification step. OK, so now, the gravitational waves at linear order are decoupled from the density perturbations. So I'm not going to consider them. I can Later on, I can consider them in parallel, because they don't interact with the tensor perturbations. Vector perturbations decay in an expanding universe. So if I look at an expanding universe, I'm going to neglect them. I will neglect the tensors because I will treat them separately afterwards. And so I'm left with these degrees of freedom. These are the ones that are coupled to matter, four degrees of freedom. So I've reduced the problem from 11 degrees of freedom to five degrees of freedom. So now comes the elimination of coordinate artifacts. I have four, uh, a four-parameter family of infinitesimal coordinate transformations. And of these four degrees of freedom, two are scalars and two are vectors. I'll tell you why. This is homework problem. Figure out why two of them are scalars and two of them are vectors. OK, so now what I will do is I will use these two scalar degrees of freedom to eliminate two variables. OK. So now I have three degrees of freedom left. I have phi, psi, and the matter fluctuation. So I've gone from 11 degrees of freedom to 3 degrees of freedom. Now what I do is I insert this and the matter ansatz into the equation of motion. So now comes the step of inserting into the equation of motion and linearizing. And then what I get is I look at the I not equal to J Einstein equation. And that tells me that phi is equal to psi, provided that delta Tij is equal to 0 for I not equal to J, which happens for perfect fluids, and it happens for uh, scalar fields. Fine. So I have one more degree of freedom eliminated. And uh, then there's the 0, 0 Einstein equation, which tells you that delta phi is a function of phi. It allows us to replace delta phi by, as a function of phi. So now I have one more degree of freedom. So I've gone all the way from 11 perturbative degrees of freedom to one perturbative degree of freedom. and now you get the equation of motion for this degree of freedom, which is phi k double prime uh, plus 2 h minus phi naught double prime over phi naught prime phi k prime plus k square plus 2 times h prime minus h phi naught double prime over phi naught prime um, phi k equals 0. This equation comes in a box.
So this is how the metric fluctuations evolve at the perturbative level. So now I've introduced a little bit of notation. I've introduced uh, conformal time. Eta is conformal time. And prime is d by d eta. And script h is a prime over a. I think everything else is defined. So this is the evolution of cosmological perturbations, in classical cosmological perturbations on super Hubble scales. And let's just look at the relation with the Newtonian equation. So you see the time evolution of cosmological perturbations is determined by Hubble friction. And then there are two competing forces. There's a pressure. We have a relativistic system. so. What is CS square is 1. We are working in conformal time, so this is simply K square. And this is, so this is the pressure, which makes perturbations oscillate. This is gravity, which makes perturbations grow. So this is a relativistic theory of cosmological perturbations. And um, I've run out of time, so I can't do step three, which is the quantum generation, but that I'll do tomorrow. So thank you. For students too. I'm a student, so. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, uh, it's not a very specific question because I don't know much about it. Uh, it's mu much more uh, a cu curious curiosity that I have. Uh, people have done it in a more general setting involving, for example, torsion and uh, fluids with spin. For torsion, the answer is yes. And for what, fluids what is, with spin, what is the effect of of that in cosmological perturbations, if any? Uh, or that I don't I don't know. Now to the other que the other question, what about if you have uh, fermions, particles yeah. with spin? Yeah. Then if you want to develop the theory of cosmological perturbations, you have to use the tetrad formulation. Yes. And actually, this is been, oh, there's only been a little bit of work on that. Okay. So there's still more work to be done to develop that. But you see, the, you see that uh, you should expect that the basic conclusions go through, because you see that they should also reduce <coughs> to the same Newtonian limit. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, in the later time, I know that uh, uh, probably this question is r irrelevant, but in earlier times when spin right. probably plays a major right. role, role. Right, right. You're absolutely right. But you see, the way that I structured the lecture is that I gave you these different steps. You identify the variables, you make a perturbation on such, you insert into the equation of motion, and you linearize. So let's go to the case of particles with spin. So now you have to use a tetrad basis. So you, the metric perturbations are going to be perturbations of the field line. And then the matter perturbations are going to be perturbations of the fermionic fields. The equation of the motion you have in the tetrad basis, and you linearize them. So in principle, it is straightforward. Now the thing that I couldn't do, the, the thing that will be a little bit more difficult is to implement these, the classification and the coordinate artifacts. 
So that, you know, that, that would be technically a little bit more difficult. But this would be a good project to, to carry through. Any further questions? That gives you that gives you this equation. Okay. So I, I have used all of them. Okay. So this is actually a combination of the see the zero i gives you no information, and this is combination of i i with zero zero. Good question. Okay, any further questions? So let's thank Robert again. Okay, we'll be back in 10 minutes after a coffee break.